in every way. I want you to turn in your Bibles today to 1 Corinthians. Uh, we're going to be in chapter 10, uh, verses 14 to 22. We're going to read the larger passage that we've been putting before you the last few Sundays as we're thinking through this matter of uh, Christian liberty and how it works itself out in the, in the life of the Christian, uh, in the fellowship of the church, and in our engaging of the world. We're going to begin at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. Stand with me if you would as we read from God's Word. You follow along as I read. Glad to have our middle daughter, Joanna, and uh, her three children with us for the week. Uh, they're out on spring break, and uh, Davis and Lane and Aggie. Lane with you, or she? She's an extended session. Um, and Davis is going to be involved this week down in Tulsa in a in a hockey camp, and so they came up to stay with us, and so he can hone his hockey skills. So we get the of being with having them with us for the week. We're glad to have that. Clifton's back at home. Continue to pray for him and his military duties. Uh, he is. Uh, he continues to catch the eye of his superiors as they they groom him and, and extend to him opportunities that are rather unusual for someone who's been in the length of time he has. So continue to pray for him. God's showing him favor, and we're looking forward to what he's going to do with him. First Corinthians chapter nine, verses twenty-four through chapter ten, verse twenty-two. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I, be I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest having preached to others I find myself should be disqualified. Chapter 10. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. The picture there of just to, to do life as they wanted to do it, with showing appreciation that they had just eaten and, drink, and drank by God's goodness, His provision. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. And God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. And here's where we pick up today in verse 14. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread. We who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Consider the people of Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices participants in the altar? What do I imply then? That food offered to idols is, in, idols is anything? Or that an idol is anything? No. I imply that what pagans sacrifice, they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? 
We just read together what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And we need to, as he's wrapping up, uh, we'll do one more installment on this next Sunday, Lord willing, wrapping up these thoughts on Christian liberty, realize that as we live, we are identifying with someone or something. And the Lord will not sit back idly and let us identify with those things contrary to him if we claim that we belong to him. Thank you. Please be seated. I'll remind you that the topic of this discussion began in chapter 8, verse 1 of 1 Corinthians. And it continues through chapter 11, verse 1, that we'll, God willing, look at next week. The question that was posed to Paul that he's answering here was, should should Christians eat the sacrifices offered to idols? And though contending that there was nothing unlawful about eating such food, Paul has, has pressed, if you've noticed throughout our whole discussion, uh, urged abstinence. He's urged abstinence in chapter 8 out of consideration for the weak conscience of those who were overly scrupulous, those who had come out of that idolatrous, pagan background. Think of your weaker brother, Paul said. Also, out of concern for the larger interest of the gospel in chapter 9, verses 1 to 23. Think about the gospel. If we're, if we're, if we're driven, if we're gospel-centered in the best sense of that, to think through gospel implications, gospel expressions, gospel influence, gospel opportunities, it's amazing how we don't have a problem with falling into the ditch of licentiousness in the name of liberty. When we stop making the gospel our primary concern that we, we can lose our way. And then third, out of concern about the consequences of self-indulgence, what we looked at last week. So today, we're going to look at this perilous situation that the Corinthians find themselves in uh, having by virtue of having been raised in Corinth in the, in the hotbed of idol worship, of pagan worship, of temple sacrifice. We're going to look at that. So Paul, Paul warns his readers against participating in sacrificial feasts within the, within the precincts of the pagan temple. I told you back when we first began this that it would not be unusual for, for, for people in Corinth to be saved out of that, saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, and begin to live lives as a Christian in the, in the congregation of the church of Corinth where Paul had established, spent 18 months there. And then these same people might have relatives who were still there, friends who were still there in that pagan environment. And it would not be unusual for them to be invited by them to a special celebration uh, that would take place at the pagan temple. In Corinth, there were those who said, I can't do that. I came out of that. I can't, I can't, I can't go back to that. There were others, ideally more mature, who said, well, it's not an issue. I mean, it's just, it's just food. It's just a place. To follow Paul to what we've been talking about, he's been pressing abstinence. The object of this discussion in this chapter, in this passage today, is to show that attendance at a pagan feast or a feast in a pagan temple is an act of idolatry. Because of the, what goes on there. Because of what it stands for. So the first thing we see in this passage, it, it begins with an urgent command to flee from idolatry. This this verse 14, therefore, my beloved, free, flee from idolatry. Verse 13, he promised a way out. God will make a way out. And Paul gave the admonition to Timothy, flee youthful lusts which war against the soul. One commentator, commentator I read years ago said, sometimes using your feet to remove yourself is a very sanctified act. Take your feet. And walk away. Get out. And that's what the picture here is, by the way. Flee. Uh, 
Robertson in his commentary said, they must not try how near they can go to the flame, but how far they can fly from it. We talked to you before about a, a mentality that you, that you find, and I think you see it increasingly as generation succeeds generation to say, well, is it, what's wrong? I tried to tell my children, what's wrong with, I'll say I'm not over the line, really, the line's right there, my feet are right there. That's the wrong question, what's wrong with it? The question is, what's right about it? What's healthy about it? What's edifying about it? What's sanctifying about it? How does it promote your growth in grace? How does it enhance your witness to the world? Those are the questions that need to be asked, not what's, what's wrong with it. When that comes out, what's wrong with it? Then you know, you don't need to scold a child when they ask that. I want to scold an adult, but uh, you say, they need to be taught, they need to be taught. They haven't been taught clearly that that's not the way you think. That's not a healthy way of thinking. The Greek verb here for, for flee from idolatry means to seek safety in flight. It means to avoid, to shun, to run away from. It's a present tense. Keep on doing that. Keep on running away from idolatry. And it's interesting, Paul uses a term here that you don't find very often in his letters. Therefore, my beloved, it's a tender term. Those whom I love. He's giving us some difficult instruction, but he wants to temper it with the, with the assurance that what I'm telling you, I'm telling you the truth in love. Proverbs says that, that the wounds of a friend are faithful, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. He's deeply involved in what's happening in Corinth, though he's miles away. The second thing we see here is this appeal to avoid idolatry is enforced by a reference to the implications of participation in the Lord's Supper. We, as you know, practice the celebration of the Lord's Supper here monthly. We tie to it the reciting of our church covenant one to another. It has many benefits. We, we avoid, or at least cut down, the possibility of forgetting Jesus. Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. We do show forth the Lord's death till he returns in that, in that act. We say to one another, we, we are with one another. You are, I belong to you, you belong to me. And we belong to the Lord. But also we say, by virtue of coming to the table, we have only one master. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who, who died and rose again and purchased me, purchased my redemption with his blood. Therefore, I'm not my own. I've been bought with a price. I belong to him. And that's what's happening in our monthly celebration of the Lord's Supper here. So look what Paul says, verses 15 to 17. I speak as to sensible people. He says, I think what I'm going to say to you is going to be meaningful to you. I, I, I'm addressing you, believing you will be sensible about it, that you'll not be irrational, that you won't go off half cocked, that you won't join the criticism of the, the, the Judaizers who, who were coming into Corinth undermining Paul's ministry there. I speak as to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing that we bless. It's not the cup, by the way, that by virtue of drinking it, you, you take in blessing. It's the cup that symbolizes the blessing of the Lord. Historically, in delivering the children of Israel from the clutches of Egypt and that big final act of the Passover, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? When we take the cup, and they did it differently than us. They had one cup and they would pass it around the room in the upper room there and they would each drink from it. We have small plastic cups, but the, but the picture, the, the implication, the teaching is the same. Anyone who would take that cup, that's why Paul gave, gave warnings to Corinth, and drink is saying, I drink this because I have participated in the blood of Christ as follows. When his blood was shed on that cross, and in Paul's case, uh, some 
30, 40 years before, 40, 50 years before. When he did that, he did that for me. And I was awakened to that. The Holy Spirit made me alive and showed me that when Jesus died on the cross, he satisfied the divine justice of God whose wrath was, was focused on me. And Jesus said, turn your wrath on me. I'm standing in that person's place. He satisfied God's divine justice by his suffering and death in our place. And therefore, when we're made alive by the Spirit, we become aware that we, we are saved, we are born again, we are brought from death to life, from darkness to light, from blindness to sight, because we share in Christ's death. Isn't it participation in the blood of Christ, Paul says? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Are we not saying when we take, in our case, the little, the little square wafer of unleavened bread? Whereas in Paul's day, in Jesus' day, in the upper room there, they had one loaf, and he, refer, he references this one loaf. Powerful pictures of, of unity, of organic connection. When we take this wafer, is it not participation in the body of Christ? Are we not saying by doing that? When Jesus was beaten beyond recognition, broken for us, slain, he did that for me. He suffered the inhuman unspeakable agony for me. And, and by virtue of taking the wafer, we're saying, I belong to him. What he did, he did for me, and I owe him everything. I surrender all. I surrender all to Jesus. I surrender. I surrender all. That's a far cry from treating Jesus as our, our heavenly street sweeper that we expect just to follow us around and clean up our messes because we gave a little nod to him. And that's what, that's what the warp and woof of Western Christianity acts like. Jesus owes me something because I said yes and I can go and live like I want to. I think I told you, I may have told you before, when I was in Russia teaching pastors years ago, we were talking one of the last days I was there. We've been pressing the implication of the gospel on them. One of the fellows came and said to, to my interpreter that they'd had a fellow come from the States, I think I told you this, big time mega church pastor who preached to them on, uh, on eternal security. And he used this illustration to them. And I don't, I don't have any reason to believe that they were lying because several, several nodded in, yeah, that's exactly what he said. Here's what this fellow said. He said, you are so secure in Christ. When you, when you commit your life to him, you are so secure in Christ that you could actually come to the point where you raise your, you, you turn your back on God, you raise your fist to God, and you say, I hate you, God. And yet he is duty-bound to save you. Brothers and sisters, that is a perversion of the doctor of assurance of, doctrine of assurance of grace and salvation and the doctrine of perseverance and preservation of salvation. And you need to read our confession on that and get, get clear on that. That's a perversion of that. I'm telling you, there are multitudes of people today who, who give no meaningful thought for God, and yet they imagine that when they die, they're going to heaven. And sadly, there are many preachers who will help them with that. There are many preachers that carry on as if all a person's got to do to get to heaven is die. Doesn't matter how he lived. Paul knows nothing of this. The cup of blessing, is it not our participation in the blood of Christ? The cup, the, the bread, is it not participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread. We who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. So what he's appealing to here is you Corinthians have got to stop fussing and fighting one another. You've got to stop finding reasons to divide with one another. You're one body. And a church that has a history and a heritage of fussing and fighting and splitting and spitting and all, 
is, is undermining the powerful picture of the death of Christ. Go read Ephesians 2 again if you want to get gripped by this again. Who takes two very different people, two very different cultures, and by his blood makes the two one. That's the power of the gospel. And Paul's, Paul's been after this. If you remember, if you've been with us the whole time, when we hit chapter 3, I mean, he has just been hammering away at this. This divisive attitude in Corinth that undermines the gospel. So the third thing he says, that the same principle holds true of the sacrifices offered by the Jews. This is not a uniquely pagan matter. Whoever partook of those sacrifices was engaging in an act of worship. Look at verse 18. Consider the people of Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices participants at the altar? Participants at the altar is language used to, aren't, aren't they worshiping? Aren't those who, who eat the sacrifices in the Levitical sacrificial system, aren't they worshiping in that? The sacrificial system was never a welfare program to make sure that everybody got fed. It was a series of festivals. We're going to look at Haggai tonight and see that his name probably means festival. We're going to look at that. It was a series of festivals and feasts designed to bring the people back time and time again on a regular interval basis to worship Yahweh. It was driven by that. And Paul, so Paul wants to know that this is not just because you're participating in, in demonic worship in the temple. To participate in, in the sacrificial system is to participate in worship. So that's why we don't. We don't bring bulls and goats and lambs, pigeons, and sacrifice them here in the name of being connected with the Old Testament. We would be worshiping that way. Jesus made it clear to the woman in John chapter 4 when she said, so um, the Samaritan woman, so you Jews say that it's on this particular mountain that you're supposed to worship, but uh, we say it's on this particular mountain. Which one is it? And Jesus said, you don't understand, woman. The time is coming when it will not be where you worship, but how you worship, in spirit and in truth. And furthermore, woman, God is looking for such. He's seeking those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. And so Paul is, is pressing now to expand the thinking of the people. It's not just, I'm not just down on pagans, because you can hear them saying, well, that's you'd expect a Jew, a guy with a Jewish background to say that, Paul. No. Isn't it true of the sacrifices of the Jews as well? The people of Israel, the idea here is Israel after the flesh. And that's literally what it means. Not, not the Israel of God. Look at Look at Galatians, just a few passages with me real quickly. Galatians 3.29. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. The children of Abraham after promise, not after, not after bloodline, not after genealogy. Galatians 6.16. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. That's what he calls true Christians. And then Philippians 3.3, 3, For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and, the, and glory in Jesus Christ and put no confidence in the flesh. That is, no, no confidence in the act of circumcision. So he's expanded his thinking to let them realize this is not a, an issue that he as a, as a fellow raised as a Jew has an issue with pagans. He has an issue with anybody identifying with anyone other than Jesus Christ if they call themselves followers of Christ. That's his issue here. So look at the fourth thing. The obvious conclusion is that to participate in a feast at a pagan temple is to share in the worship of the idol. If you followed him through this here, you know what he's saying is not a matter of the meat tainted, it's just meat. So whether it's served in the temple or whether it's served in the marketplace or served in the home of a friend, that's not what's at issue here. It's a matter of with whom are you identified.
Look at verse 19. What do I imply then? That food offered to idols is anything? Expecting a no answer. Or that an idol is anything? He said, do you think I'm, do you hear me saying that you need to stay away from that because, because that God's not the real God? No. Because the food, the food offered is, is just food. The idol is nothing. It's just wood or stone or, or metal, however it was made. Nothing. No. I imply, verse 20, that what pagans sacrifice they offer to demons. And here he's getting down to the heart of it now. And not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. Remember what we said when we started this? That in Christ, when Christ sets us free, he sets us free indeed. And we have this liberty, this big field of Christian liberty. Remember your bulletins. You've been seeing it on the bulletins. I hope you haven't just started glazing over because it's the same picture every week. It's the same picture every week because it's trying to make a point. The field of Christian liberty is bounded by a fence of self-denial. And Paul is teaching here that if you belong to Jesus Christ, if you're Christ's free man, free woman, free boy, free girl, then, then there are things that you will not do so that you will not be identified as belonging to someone or something other than Jesus Christ. Dawson Trotman, founder of the Navigators, had one of the best short lines that I've ever come across on this topic. Others may, I cannot. Others may. So in other words, he was not a legalist. He wouldn't say, well, if I can't, you can't. How can you do that if I can't? He didn't. Others may, I cannot. He did not want to confuse and harm his witness, causing people to ask, who does he belong to? Who does he belong to? I do not want you to be participants with demons, and that's, that's what it comes down to. And what may appear harmless, it sends a confusing message that your devotion is not exclusively to Jesus Christ, and you're harming your witness and you're tarnishing, you're damaging the reputation of Christ, and you're, you're, you're casting aspersion on the power of the gospel. 1 Corinthians 8, 4. We're back now to where we started this in chapter 8. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that, and this he's quoting here, an idol has no real existence, and there is no God but one. So he's citing what they had said to him. Remember, we talked about that? This was, the, this was the argument of the so-called strong. Look, there's no such, idols are just nothing. There's only one God. Well, that's, that's a truth declaration. But to make that truth declaration and then con conclude that you then have liberty to step into some areas is to cast aspersion on your witness and tarnish the image of Christ. And you may not have expected him to get here, by the way. If you haven't read through 1 Corinthians before, you may have thought when he said this in chapter 8, verse 4, he was going a different direction. No, he's stating the truth. But he says that we don't then use liberty as excuses to undo our witness. And there's no inconsistency here between what he says in verse 19 and 20, what he says in chapter 8, verse 4. Demons. Participating with demons. You cannot be a worshiper of Christ at the same time be a worshiper of demons. When we share at the Lord's table, we are renouncing demons. And we then participate in other activities that cast aspersion on the exclusivity of Christ, the power of Christ, the purity of Christ, the glory of Christ, the gospel of Christ, then we are renouncing 
the Lord's table. Look at verse 21. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. Now, obviously you can. Obviously you can. You, you, they could go from their, from their <clears throat> love feast they had in the Corinthian church and head on down to the temple and eat there. You can, you can physically do that. He said, but you cannot do that and maintain your witness and your integrity. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. You, Jesus but no one can serve two masters. Because you'll hate one and love the other. You cannot serve God and mammon, the things of the world. <clears throat> and what, what you learn as you study the scripture on this is Jesus offers us eternal life, abundant life, meaningful life. Joy, true joy. The devil offers pleasure. And all you had to do, by the way, was look at the contrast of worship in the church at Corinth and worship in the church, worship in the temple at Corinth. The one in the temple was a very uh, promiscuous, very sensual. In the church at Corinth, it was very holy, very spiritual. <clears throat> in the temple at Corinth, they, they played to the flesh. In the church at Corinth, they looked to heaven. In the temple at Corinth, they said, indulge. In the church in Corinth, they said, deny. There is a, there's a world of contrast between true worship. And hear me now. It's because you got a building, you got a steeple, you got a name that has the word church in it. Doesn't mean that you've renounced. the worship of demons, and embraced exclusively the worship of Christ. All across this country, there are things happening and done in the name of Christ that are not done to the glory of Christ. And you've said, I've said this before, we're, we're sort of on the north side of one of the meccas of the fleshly, sensual, Indulge yourself. Go for the ultimate goal in life, which is to be happy. We're in that climate. If we're not careful, we won't make a distinction. We won't be discerning. When we look at the scriptures, it says be holy. When we pursue holiness, guess what you find when you pursue holiness? You know this. Joy. Real happiness. When you delight in God as the chief object of our affection, when you delight in Jesus as the one who left the splendor of heaven and came and lived despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows acquainted, all too acquainted with grief, and when you, when you delight in him, when you find him as the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star, the fairest of 10,000, to my soul, when he is that to us. It's interesting. Life doesn't have to go our way. We don't have to chase those elusive butterflies of, of whatever, whatever the latest fad is. We walk like pilgrims with our back turned to the city of destruction on our way to the celestial city, having fellowship and communion with those who are going there. We are, we are like the people in the old hymn. We are, we are bound for the promised land. We are bound for the promised land. Oh, will you g come and go with me? This is where it's subtle, folks. When Paul wrote this, there was one church in Corinth, and everything else was obviously not. Today, there are many, many buildings 
that have this word in it, church. And when you examine it, somehow they've decided you can mix the two. You can't mix the two. I promise you, a church that says intentionally or simply accidentally, we want to embrace all these things, and Holy Spirit, we want you in here too, the Holy Spirit says, I'm out. I'm not going to make my presence known. Or people think they can live mocking my God. Mocking the Savior, the, the precious Son. So Paul is serious about this. We feed at the Lord's table, the table presided over by him. And it becomes an occasion of fellowship with him. And Paul warns that to not think this through, to carry on as if anything is okay, that, that, <clears throat> that God is satisfied with anything, as long as we give him a little nod every now and then. Don't totally ignore him, just give him a little nod. God says, oh, that's neat. They paid attention. No. Paul says, that's not it. This will provoke him. Notice, shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? He's a jealous God. It's not because he's insecure. It's because he's holy. And he will not share his glory with another. Not me. Not you. Not a church not a denomination, he will not share his glory with another. And any, any mindset, individually or collectively, that determines that we're just gonna kind of work God in. He goes out. I read an article this weekend, and I've, I've forgotten the date, but I was in 1962 and I was in I was in school, 10 years old, 1962. It's when the Supreme Court said, prayer in school is unconstitutional. The liberal geniuses on the Supreme Court. Of course, it wasn't long after that, the Ten Commandments were not allowed. And, and I grew up early on in the days when we had the Ten Commandments on the wall of our, of, and I don't get, I'm not, don't, don't, let's not lose sight here. I'm not one of these guys that gets all, exercised about having the Ten Commandments stuck everywhere. I'm not impressed with people who want to do that if they can't cite the Ten Commandments. Okay? You make us look foolish. Those of us who do know what the content of it is. So all that stuff happened. And God said, fine. You want to acknowledge me? Let's see how you can work it out on your own. Well, where are we now? 2018. We can't even figure out in 2018 how to get kids to stop going into schools and killing people. When I was in school, in high school, so fast forward beyond being, being 10, when, it wasn't unusual to walk out in the parking lot and you would see pickup truck after pickup truck after pickup truck that had, had a, a gun rack inside of it, guns hanging on it, loaded guns. Today, if a child takes a Pop-Tart and eats it down into the form of a pistol, leadership goes apoplectic over it. Now, how is that? I'm hearing all these people talk about, here's the solution. Let me tell you what the solution is. Fall on our faces, repent to God that we actually thought we could live without him, and the church rise up and say, Lord, we're going to have let done with lesser things. We're going to follow you no matter what it costs us, no matter where it takes us, no matter what this culture thinks of us. We're not going to play footsies with Baal anymore. And I think the God who has said, him who honors me I will honor, would rise up. But perhaps not. We've been studying on Sunday nights, have we not? But sometimes our religious culture goes too far and God doesn't even offer them an opportunity to return. He simply says, strap in. What's about to come is going to blow you out of your seat if you're not strapped in. Paul is dead serious about this stuff. Hodge said, Je jealousy is the feeling 
which arises from wounded love, and it is the fiercest of all human passions. So Paul uses it as an illustration of the hatred of God towards idolatry. The first verse in this. Flee idolatry. I'm going to ask you this when we close. What do you have in your life that is more important to you than your relationship to God? What is there that grabs your passion more than God? That's your idol. Your idols. I ask people this from time to time. I, ask, I look myself in the mirror and ask myself this. Bill, what do you have to have in this life to be content? Another way to ask is, is Jesus Christ enough for you to find ultimate contentment in him in this life? Because if I need Jesus plus, then I've just factored Jesus out of the equation. That's what Paul's calling the Corinthians to. In the name of liberty. <clears throat> I ask myself this this way. Am I using my liberty to touch people for Christ? Am I using my liberty to, to glorify the Lord, to, to demonstrate in word and deed <clears throat> that I belong to Him? Nobody else. That He is enough, more than enough for me. And when I, when I find areas that I'm not, I hate that in myself. I repent of that. I pray God give me grace to put the ax to the root of that, to crucify it. As the Apostle Paul said, I delight after the law of God in my inmost being. That was Paul, the saved man. And when you go as deep as you could go in him, and oh, brothers and sisters, I want that for me. I want that for you. I want us to be a people who, who sees the liberty we have in Christ, who gladly embrace self-denial for the greater glory of God and the advance of the gospel. And I want us to be delivered so that we do not look like people who, who serve at the Lord's table and then go and serve at the demon's table. I don't want that. For me, I don't want it for you. I want it to be clear who we belong to, whose we are, Therefore, who we are. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, you are the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we look into your word today and... Lord, Paul, Paul wrote this to people. That there, was, there was one church and a church he had planted and established on clear gospel footing in a culture that if, if, if you were... Identified as a Christian, you were looked upon as someone who had turned your back on your culture. God, we live in a day when, when, when all around us, people who imagine they are Christians, and they live no differently than the world. What would the apostle say if he wrote to Bethel Church in Owasso? Help us to read this, Lord. To take inventory and to think through and to sell out anew and afresh to the Lordship of Jesus Christ in our lives. And Father, for those here who are not yet followers of Christ, help us to repent to them if we've sent mixed messages. Help us to live before them in such a way that a radical transformation is obvious and they would, they would see the clear line of delineation. And that they would be gripped by your glory and your grace shown in Jesus Christ. And your spirit would, would woo them, convict them, convince them of sin, and save them. Help us to be on the journey together, bound for the promised land. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's